Thank you all so much for coming to YouTube on Main Street. My name is Gwen Wells. I'm a manager of programming strategy at YouTube, and we are thrilled to have you here today. This is our first of many events here at Sundance this week in our YouTube on Main Street venue. Um, YouTube is the sponsor of the shorts films here at the festival, um, and we are also streaming live um, a, a show called Live at Sundance, which is being shot every day um, and in the Nest studio right behind you. Um, it's kind of the latest of what's happening at the festival, and it's being streamed live every day onto Sundance's YouTube channel. Um, and we also have lots of events and panels going on throughout the week here, so um, please come back and join us. And this is our first event here. Um, this panel is called Make Your Voice Heard, Technology and Social Impact. And we have a great lineup of panelists. So when we looked at the, the lineup of documentaries at the festival this year, we were really struck by two films that we'll be featuring here in the panel today. They're very moving films and very different films, but they have a common theme, which is that they highlight individuals who have used technology to break down barriers of communication and really have had incredible social impact worldwide. Um, so I'm going to introduce our panelists, and then we're going to see uh, two short clips from each of the films, and we'll hear from the filmmakers and um, one of the film subjects who is here. And um, then we have a chance to hear from two of our panelists who sort of work more generally on film financing for social impact films and also on um, campaigns, social impact campaigns. And so they can speak with us more generally about you know, what they're looking for, the work that they do, and trends that, that they're seeing. And we will have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. And then we will have um, a reception from, uh, from two to three, so you are welcome to join us for that afterwards. So um, first we have Greg Barker, who is the director of We Are the Giant. Greg is a war correspondent turned filmmaker, and he has made several films. Um, most recently before this one was Manhunt, which was here at the festival last year and went on to win a primetime Emmy. We have Mariam. Mariam, I'm going to let you say your last name for me because I will butcher it. Can you say your name for us? Sure, I'm sorry. it's Mariam El Khawaja. Thank you. <laughs> um, Mariam is a human rights defender, and um, she is banned from her home country of Bahrain. Um, she is living in Denmark. She's a citizen of Denmark, and she is the acting president of the Bahrain Center for Human Rights. Uh, we have Brian Knappenberger, who is the director of the Internet's Own Boy, the story of Aaron Swartz. Um, Brian also has made several acclaimed documentaries. Um, most recently before this was We Are the Legion, the story of the hacktivists. And next to Brian, we have Dan Kogan, who is the co-founder and executive director of Impact Partners, a fund and service for, <laughs> for philanthropists and investors who are interested in creating social change through film. And Impact Partners, since its inception in 2007, has been involved in more than 50 films. Um, maybe one of most note would be The Cove, which won the Academy Award a few years ago. And over at the end, least but last but not least, we have Christy Marchese, who is the executive director and founder of Motion Picture Motion. Um, Christy designs and runs social action campaigns for films, documentaries, and narratives, and connects independent, independent filmmakers and their films with audiences. Um, so thank you all so much for being here. And I'd love to start with Greg and Mariam, if you can um, tell us about uh, We Are the Giant, and then after uh, they introduce the film, we'll see a clip. Thanks, so it's great to be here. Uh, we Are the Giant is a uh, film that's really about the, it takes an audience into the experience of being a revolutionary. Uh, the characters are all from the Middle East, but the story really cuts across time and culture, and we see in the film I think that people who, are, people who are standing up for the same ideals that inspired Martin Luther King, uh, Gandhi, even the American Revolution, and we see how those ideals are playing themselves out now. So it's, um, and for me personally, it's probably the most inspiring and uh, humbling uh, film that I've ever been involved with. These characters, uh, over the course of the two and a half years that we've been filming, uh, became my own personal heroes, and one of them is sitting right next to me here, Miriam Alkawaja. Thank you, Greg. 
Um, it's really great to be here. I think when we talk about the movie, We Are the Giant, what's most important to me is that you'll see in the movie, if you come tomorrow to the premiere, that the story of the revolutions and the movements are being told through individual and personal stories. But what's very important to always remember is that these are just a few faces of millions of people who took to the streets. And to me, the real heroes are the people who are out there still today on the streets facing the guns. And so it's important to recognize the people in the movie, but it's also very important to remember that we're just three, four, five faces from millions of heroes who have decided to you know, basically ignore the fear because the consequences are still very real. But they have found the cause that is worth fighting for despite the fear that they have of what the consequences may be. Thank you. Um, so let's roll the clip. It was my father being beaten, and um, I immediately, I remember, I immediately felt tears coming down my face, and I immediately stopped myself and got to work. I typed up the case. Uh, it was, it was difficult. But when I read that, I couldn't even cry. I felt like there was, there was so much pain that I couldn't even get it out. I felt like I had trouble breathing even. Like it was, it was painful to breathe. Just to breathe in air was painful. The first time I heard about how he was tortured, I said, of course people are going to say we need to fight back. It only makes sense. How long can people stay peaceful? this mentality, but as a human rights activist, I can't advocate for that. I have to advocate for peaceful resistance. I remember once there was this one person who wrote to me on Twitter, and he was saying, why are you still telling people to stay peaceful? We need to fight back. This is it. I mean, it's not even about using violence to overthrow the government. It's self-defense. They're coming into our homes and beating our children in front of us. We need to fight back. And then he sent me this video and he said, look at this woman and how she's explaining how she was sexually assaulted by security forces when they arrested her husband. And he said, when I watch this video, all I can think about is using violence, using a method to protect our families. And when I opened the video, it was my uncle's wife describing what had happened to her when I, my uncle had been arrested. So I wrote back to him and I said, the woman that you just pointed out is actually my uncle's wife. And I'm still telling you, you need to stay peaceful. And I told him, well, with the first weapon that you carry, they will use that as a reason to completely wipe you out. Thank you. Um, so before we talk more about We Are the Giant, I want to make sure that we introduce our other film, The Internet's Own Boy, the story of Aaron Swartz. So maybe, Brian, you can mm -hmm. introduce us to the film, and then we'll show the clip that you okay. prepped. Um, yeah, my film, The Internet's Own Boy, is about is the story of Aaron Schwartz, who's a child prodigy internet activist uh, whose fingerprints are all over the early internet. He was a contributor to RSS. He was one of the architects of Creative Commons. Uh, and he was one of the co-founders of Reddit, which is, uh, became the, the number one social news site in the world. Um, oh, you can't hear me. Um, <clears throat> at, uh, at age 19, he, s he sells Reddit uh, for a lot of, becomes a rich 19-year-old, and decides to sort of forego the startup culture and get into social um, uh, justice issues, political organizing. And he does these kind of amazing things using technology, using his skills as a programmer. To, uh, to sort of um, mobilize people for, for uh, direct action. Um, lots of interesting stuff. He gets, he gets caught up in a legal nightmare, a two-year legal nightmare, for downloading 4.7 million uh, academic journal articles from the online service JSTOR. Um, he, uh, this uh, two-year legal battle is so intense, and uh, the prosecution against him wants to make an example of him, so it keeps ramp ramping up the pressure against him. And this ultimately ends in, in his suicide. 
So this is a story of his life, the early innovations, the, uh, the, the kinds of in innovations that he did with, with regard to social justice, and, that, uh, and those, those kind of problems with the uh, justice system that his case brought up. Okay, thanks, let's roll the clip. SOPA was the bill that was intended to curtail online piracy of music and movies, but what it did was basically take a sledgehammer to a problem that needed a scalpel. There's collateral damage. Only a handful of us who said, look, we're not for piracy either, but it makes no sense to destroy um, the architecture of the internet, the domain name system, and so much that makes it free and open in the name of fighting a piracy, and Aaron got that right away. The freedoms guaranteed in our Constitution, the freedoms our country had been built on, would be suddenly deleted. New technology, instead of bringing us greater freedom, would have snuffed out fundamental rights we'd always taken for granted. And I realized that day that I couldn't let that happen. I don't think anybody really thought that SOPA could be beaten. I remember him just turning to me and being like, I think we might win this. Aaron was one of the most prominent people in a community of people who help lead organizing around social justice issues at the federal level in this country. It was like Aaron had been like striking a match and it was being blown out. Striking another one was being blown out. And finally he'd like managed to catch enough kindling that the, the flame actually caught and then they turned into this roaring blaze. Wikipedia went black, Reddit went black, Craigslist went black, the phone lines on Capitol Hill flat out melted. Members of Congress started rushing to issue statements, retracting their support for the bill that they were promoting just a couple days ago. And that was when as hard as it was for me to believe, after all this, we had won. The thing that everyone said was impossible, that some of the biggest companies in the world had written off as kind of a pipe dream, had happened. We did it. We won. This is a historic week in internet politics, maybe American politics. The thing that we heard from people in Washington DC from staffers on Capitol Hill was they received more emails and more phone calls on Super Blackout Day than they'd ever received about anything. I think that was an extremely exciting moment. This was the moment when the internet had grown up. You know, it's easy sometimes to feel like you're powerless. Like when you come out in the streets and you march and you yell and nobody hears you. But I'm here to tell you today, you are powerful. For him, it was more important to be sure that you made a small change than to play a small part in a big change. But SOPA was like playing a major part in a major change. <laughs> and so for him, it was kind of this proof of concept. Like, okay, I, you know, what I wanna do with my life is change the world. And this shows that it's possible, right? That the thing that I wanna do with my life is possible. So um, there's obviously a lot to discuss in both of these films, um, but I would love to maybe start by hearing from both filmmakers. Um, if you can just tell us a bit about, you know, what what has really inspired you by the care, you know, about the characters that that you followed here, especially kind of in their use of um, technology and in their, um, you know, sort of their morals and like the social the social impact they were sort of setting out to to make happen and, and how they were doing that? Uh, well, I, I guess I'll use this as an example. SOPA, uh, Stop Online Piracy Act, um, was uh, kind of an amazing, kind of rousing uh, defeat of a bill that would have really had serious kind of uh, freedom of speech issues. Um, and uh, it, it sort of ramifications and, and, and could, could have hurt, hurt the internet pretty significantly, I think. Um, and what they did, I think, was really innovative with SOPA. They did, uh, they did things like uh, a creative use of voice over IP where uh, people that were upset, and this is the first time I've seen this used, is uh, people were, that were upset with the bill could go to the website, click, put, click in your um, uh, zip code, hit return, and you're, and you're automatically connected by phone to your representative's office. Literally that easy. Um, so they did little things like that where that were particularly innovative that using the internet in order to to spur people into direct action in a really, really, really easy way. It was incredibly effective. What Peter said in here is that most of the people they talked to on Capitol Hill have never gotten this many calls from anyone about anything. And so um, they also used uh, you know, tools like uh, YouTube 
to um, gamers got out, got involved, and they started doing these kind of rants at camera, these kind of horrible backlit, <laughs> hour-long rants, and it became this thing where everybody had to kind of contribute to it. And um, one of the kind of uh, statements that he made in the speech there uh, the, that we have in the in the film is um, that everybody became the hero of their own story. Everybody used those tools in ways that kind of made sense for them, but also kind of was this direct action. So I think um, what Aaron's story tells us and tells me about that kind of direct action is that creative use of these tools can be really, really effective. But I think what we also learned from uh, and have learned in the last couple of years is that there's a, there's a real dark side to, to the internet too, a, a brutal dark side. And um, the internet can be awesome and it can be awful. And some of these same tools that uh, I was talking with Miriam actually right before we started. Um, a particular example of, um, that, that was poignant for me was the revolution in Iran. Iran, which, which was called the Twitter revolution, right? And uh, governments who uh, often buy surveillance tools around the world from the EU, from American companies, uh, to surveil their own citizens and, and dissidents in their country, they tracked down people that were in that revolution and they killed them. So the internet has this, this kind of intense uh, amplifying to these kinds of activities that cuts both ways. Thanks, Greg. <coughs> yeah, well, that's very interesting. and. Um, I think, I mean, without, um, uh, you know, what's interesting looking at these characters and looking at revolutions across time is that revolutionaries have tended to always use the latest, most subversive technology, whether it's pamphlets during the American Revolution or, and, and now, of course, the internet. So that's sort of, historically, it's nothing surprising about that. But in terms of, as, in terms of a, as a filmmaker, we never could have made this film without, without you know, aggressive use of social media and, and, and the internet. And um, I don't want to take credit for it. I had an amazing team led by my co-producer who's on a plane, Razan Gaini, who's a, a young Arab American filmmaker who sort of mastered that whole sort of network of activists. And we managed to find ways of, of getting footage out of, of you know, very, very dangerous places in Syria. One of our main characters is outside of Damascus who we just can't get to, to him. And we've had footage, cameras smuggled in, footage smuggled out. Miriam and her sister Zainab, who's currently in prison, are aggressive users of social media. Um, and so that plays a big part of the film. Um, but it's really the, um, uh, it's, it's really, it is, it's, it's a tool. And what's also interesting on the dark side is that the Bahraini government, um, a lot of our footage comes from, is of Bahraini tr you know, stormtroopers cracking down in, in, in neighborhoods and arresting people. A lot of that footage actually was shot by the Bahraini government themselves and put up on YouTube perhaps to show how brutal they are. It's not surprising. I mean, Saddam Hussein, uh, when he took power in 1979, filmed sort of a, uh, a group of, of his supporters who were being one by one led off to their executions. He filmed that and then distributed videotapes of that around the country to show how tough he was. So, so it's just it's the same kind of idea, but this t tool can be used either way. But there are very clever people who are, who are using it to, and, and the thing is, Activists are, tend to be more nimble than the governments. So I think they have one step ahead. Well, that, yeah. yeah, I mean, just one step ahead, I think. I mean, I think new, new technologies are often tools of disruption, so they become the tools of revolutionaries. But then soon thereafter, they become the tools of control. And so the, really the only r way to keep it going is to keep the, keep the technological fires burning. Um, Mariam, I'd love for, for you to talk about... Um, kind of the, the work that, that you do and the use of, of social media and technology in, in what you've been able to accomplish and what you continue to do. Sure, I mean, to echo on what's already been said, there has been attempts to call the movements or the uprisings or revolutions or whatever you want to call it in the Middle East as Twitter or Facebook revolutions. And I would disagree with that. I think they were youth revolutions. And Twitter and Facebook and social media were a tool, a very important tool at that, but a tool. Uh, that were used by the youth in creating the movements and so on. Um, but again, also to echo, um, they are these, these tools can also be a double-edged sword. Because at the end of the day, for example, um, for people like me who are activists, most of the death threats that we get are through places like Twitter. Um, and they usually come from the government, but now this allows it, f that it allows them to be more anonymous when they do it. Uh, we know it's them, and they know that we know it's them, but there's no way for us to really prove it because we don't have the same kind of finance and spyware technology for us to actually be able to track where these threats are coming from. Um, 
But I think that being said, Twitter and Facebook have played a humongous role in our activism, and especially in Bahrain. Bahrain has one of the highest Twitter activity rates in the, in the region. And that's, for, to a certain extent, it's also because Bahrain has been one of the uprisings that was the least covered by uh, regular media. And so people had to find different ways to make sure that the world still knew what was going on. And so it's, the, the uprising in Bahrain is so well documented on Twitter, that if you go on Twitter and if you know who to follow, you can actually get an hour, sometimes even half an hour by half an hour update of what's, what exactly is happening on the ground. We put out information about who's being arrested, who's being tortured, who's being disappeared. And so it's, you know, it's constant and it's instant. And that's why, like, for example, one of the first things I did when I got here was get internet. Because for me, internet is some, one of the most important things. And if I don't have internet, it means I can't do my work. But then we also use it for many other purposes as well. I mean, as a human rights group, we actually use it in our documentation work. So to a certain extent, one of the cool things about it is that it's kind of, it's kind of like having an online support team. For example, if I'm writing a report about how the Bahraini government demolished mosques in Bahrain, um, all I have to do is write one tweet, 140 characters, asking people to send me footage of that. And within minutes, I'll have hundreds of responses with uh, links of um, footage and pictures and so on. And I just include that in my reports. And so it really has done an amazing um, thing for us in regards to our work and how fast we can get information out there. But then again, I think one of the things that also is um, a bit of a negative effect is that when the videos were coming out of Syria in the beginning, you know, you would watch these videos of people being killed or tortured to death and so on, and it would affect you. It would, you know, you would really feel something when you watch it. But I feel now we, to some extent, we've become decentralized because of it. Because we see, we've seen hundreds and hundreds of videos of people getting their heads cut off and tortured to death and children dying and so on, that we're able to look at the video and go about our regular day because of that. And it's one of the things that really scares me about where we're headed. If, you know, many, many years ago we saw the genocides that happened and we said never again, but now we're watching it live in front of us. And yet we're able to go about our days knowing that's happening and not really doing much about it. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I'd love to also hear from, from Greg and, and from Brian how, how making a film about these individuals that, that you did, how it sort of um, made you think differently maybe about the filmmaking process. You talked about this a little, Greg. Um, but how it's made you think differently about connecting with your audiences um, also, I think, you know, one of the things that was interesting to us in setting up this panel is not only to feature these films and these individuals, but then look at how can filmmakers like yourselves use these same tools in the financing of your films, the making of your films, the distribution of your films. Yeah, just, it's interesting, as a, just from a directing standpoint, some films, you know, you go into and you have a, a vision and a concept and you kind of like impose that on the, on the, the, the story. Um, this film was totally opposite. This film was kind of made from the ground up. And, and uh, it's kind of like I had to, as a director, kind of free myself from like the desire to kind of, you know, control everything. Because actually, you can't, this stuff is just coming up. You know, we're getting stuff off of YouTube and smuggled out of Syria. And it's like, okay, just like, you just go with it. But that's kind of in the spirit of, what, of what's happening. And, 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 and I, so the film, ha I mean, just filmically has an incredibly sort of, gritty sort of immediate feel, very rough, incredibly rough around the edges feel. And I think that kind of informs the whole story. And it's, it's been exciting as a, uh, as a filmmaker to, to, to sort of go down that path and try something new. Um, but in terms of getting the message out, I mean, we are trying to, we're, you know, launching a social media campaign now around called Free Zainab. I think you've got a lot of uh, buttons around that. Um, to, um, to try to get her sister Zainab out of, out of prison right now. So it's actually, we're, we're, we're hoping to use the, the same tools of the revolutionaries that also allowed us to make the movie to actually try to affect some change and to put pressure not just on the Bahraini government, because I think they're going to do what they're going to do, but on our own government, because Bahrain is a close United States ally. And it is actually, the reason you don't hear a lot about it, because it's incredibly difficult for mainstream media to cover it because of the press restrictions. It's a close ally of Saudi Arabia, um, the U.S. Navy's fifth fleet is based in Bahrain, and there are enormous vested interests in keeping um, the story quiet and, uh, and, and keeping the, the status quo 
intact. And it's our intention with this film as we roll out over the next year is to, ch to change that and shake that up. And we will be using social media um, and the tools of the revolutionaries to try to affect that change. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think w his points about sort of crowdsourcing of footage and stuff is are really great. I mean, I, I maybe w um, one thought I could add to that is that I, I sort of feel like filmmakers now need to have a conversation earlier with the people that might be interested in their films. Um, there is a tendency, I think, among filmmakers to say, like, oh, you know, I'm making this thing, it's mine, I don't want to show anybody until it's done and it's perfect. Um, and I, we're not in that world anymore. Um, you know, you want to share what you're doing. You want to have other people be a part of it because they can contribute to it. Uh, they can give you new information, new things that you didn't know. Um, you know, but a lot more than a, a handful of researchers, you've got this whole, this whole kind of community. Um, so what's been helpful for us certainly is uh, things, well, the Kickstarter campaign, obviously, for obvious reasons. I would argue that um, Funding on Kickstarter is probably the second or secondary, uh, th th not the most important aspect to it. Um, the most important aspect by far is creating a community of people that's sort of built in and excited and feels like they're part of your, of your community. So we have, I haven't um, released any trailers or anything for this film. I've, lived, I've released big five minute, eight minute clips at a time uh, of different things before we even made the film for the internet. Um, and some of that's changed and altered, you know, where it's, so it's not necessarily a central point of the film. But I, I feel like all along there's been this really direct uh, conversation that I've had with people. Uh, and, and now, you know, those, that group of people is interested to see the final result. I mean, so in a real practical sense, um, we live in a time where our tools as filmmakers can just, we can reach our audience directly. And are you um, releasing some of the film over Creative Commons? Are you using? Yeah, that so that's platform? another thing that we're that we're working on. Aaron was the architect of Creative Commons, so we're um, so we're going to release the film in some form at some point in a full Creative kind of Creative Commons release. Uh, so, which is uh, which is to say, we're not going to um, track down piracy. We're not going to uh, prosecute people for for sharing. Um, that sort of thing. Uh, my last film, We Are Legion, the story of the hacktivist, is one of the most pirated films of the year that year. <laughs> you might imagine, wh you know, why. But um, you know, that's that's something I think that has been uh, over overstated by uh, by you know MPA and others about about how dangerous it is. I think it actually helps uh, filmmakers trying to get their word out Thanks. to some degree. I mean, this, this isn't the, this isn't a world of extremes. You know, there's. Um, I'd like to move down to, to Dan and to Christy, um, and maybe um, Dan, just kind of following this conversation, if you can talk to us about, you know, recent, sort of in recent years, are you seeing more and more filmmakers when they come to you, um, you know, with a project, are they kind of having ideas about their social impact campaigns kind of earlier and earlier? And, you know, are you looking for that when you're deciding to get involved in a project? Can you just kind of talk to us generally about that? Yeah, there are a lot of filmmakers who are doing that, and it's a huge, huge... Uh, is this a little bit better? There are a lot of filmmakers who are doing that, and it's a huge plus. I would say there really are two groups of filmmakers that we're seeing. One is is traditional filmmakers who still imagine that they're going to make their film, they're not going to share it beforehand, they're going to sell it to a broadcaster or a theatrical distributor. And then there's a group of filmmakers who feel like they're going to do whatever they need to do to get the film out there. And that group is already thinking about aggregating audience through crowdfunding or through social media from the very beginning of the process. And increasingly, that's valuable because if you can't make those sales, then you have a ready-made army to help support the distribution of the film. And one of the things that's happened in the last year in the marketplace is that the ability to distribute your film yourself from your own website has really come of age. It used to be that you could only sell a DVD off of your website, and now, thanks to sites like VHX and Real House, you can actually act essentially as your own iTunes. You can show trailers, you can stream, you can sell downloads, you can sell DVDs, you have analytics, you can aggregate your audience through social media. And so for a film that has the ability to communicate with an audience that's passionate about what it's dealing with, 
that is a film that, that can self-distribute. Not every film has that ability, and not every film speaks to a broad enough audience that that can make a difference in terms of revenue. But for films that can, it gives you an end run around the gatekeepers in terms of distribution. Got it. Um, and so, I mean, do you think there's ever a point where, when it's too early for a filmmaker to, to sort of be thinking about this, this outreach and this camp, these campaigns? Um, or do you think kind of the, the sooner in the process, the better? I think it's never too early to do that. I mean, what you're really doing is exploring what your audience wants to see in that film and gathering their support and their understanding. And that can reflect itself in the way that the film is made in a very positive way. So I would say it's never too early to start having that conversation with your audience. You know, there are leftovers from an earlier age that still impact on that. So for example, there are rules in uh, the Academy uh, that you cannot share more than 10 minutes of your film online before its qualification for an Academy Award. Which so I haven't done, by the way. <laughs> Nine minutes and 59 seconds. <laughs> So, you know, if you, if you want to be in that game, um, and I would argue that's a game that's not worth being in for most films, but, but anyway, if you want to be in that game, then you have to follow those rules, but increasingly, those rules are antiquated, and I think over time, those rules will change to reflect a world in which sharing is much more part of the process than it used to be. Great. Um, Christy, I'd love to hear from you if you can tell us about when you get involved with a project and kind of what, what your process is for working with films around creating campaigns. Sure, we, we typically get involved, we like to get involved as early as possible, but typically right around post-production as the filmmakers are really thinking about, okay, here's what my film is shaping up to look like, here's what I think the story is gonna be, and here's what I think I want it to do. And so we usually sit down with the filmmakers and look at the film and look at the people who are in the film and any organizations they've spoken with in the process and to try and figure out what is the social action, what is the what do you want to do with this film and how are we gonna do it. So we've we worked at all stages. We've come in at festival, we've come in at theatrical, but we prefer to come in and be a part of that strategy um, and kind of develop it uh, towards the end of the film's production. Great. Um, and also, I mean, I, I, I'm sure that many films and filmmakers have, have great um, plans and intentions, but obviously kind of executing a great campaign can be challenging and can have obstacles. Can you maybe sort of talk about what some of those challenges are and then maybe when you see people doing it really well, if there are some themes to kind of successful campaigns? Yeah, I can. So many, so many things to answer in there. Uh, yeah, I think there's a couple things. Uh, one, one, a couple things I've seen filmmakers do really right is maintaining great relationships with the, the organizations that are in the film or that they've done research with um, in the process of making it and having great communication. So as they're finishing the film, they're very realistic about what their, what their role is in the film and the finished product, product and what their role will be in the campaign. So kind of for us, when we come in, they have those relationships well maintained. It's great. We bring them to the table. We have great conversations and we figure out what can we do together. Um, I feel like this word has been used a lot, but the film is a tool for much of these organizations, and that's how we how we work with films. Is how do these organizations use this film as a tool for for their work, or how do we come together and develop certain initiatives to use the film to achieve some sort of change? Um, I think Greg, you mentioned a bit about the um, campaign that you guys are are setting out on, but it would be great um, to hear from both Greg and Brian if there are certain um, aspects of your of your social impact campaign that you'd like the audience to know about, um, you know, while you're sort of launching your film here at, at Sundance. Uh, sure. I mean, yes, we'd love you to uh, tweet about the film. Uh, uh, hashtag We Are the Giant, um, and also um, hashtag Free Zainab. Uh, there's, it's on the buttons. Uh, Zainab, as I mentioned, is, um, is Miriam's uh, sister, who's an enormous character in the film, and uh, kind of really, for me, somebody that I think history could look back on as somebody on par with uh, an Aung San Suu Kyi type figure. And you really see her and her family's development um, and, uh, and, and, and sort of decision to embark on a path of of uh, aggressive, not gr aggressive, but um, um, nonviolence that's very active and very um, sort of in your face. And uh, it's really deeply inspiring. So what we'd love is for people to kind of, is to, is to tweet about it, to, if you mention, if you, and come to see the film, of course. And then down the road, once we get to the distribution, I mean, there's two kind of phases when you look at it. It's like you're at Sundance, which is a limited time, four to six screenings, 
and and then there's the there's the rollout over the course of the year and the distribution. So one looks at what can do one can do right now, and then you know ultimately we'd like to have real tangible impact along the lines of like look at what Invisible War has done. I mean it's kind of extraordinary, and or the Cove of course. But um, but those played out over the course of of you know the, the rollout of the whole film. So that's what we'd like to to do for for uh, for for the next year. Uh, yeah, there's a couple of uh, or organizations that I've been involved with since the, we have started making this film. Um, one is called StopWatching.us. It's on online, StopWatching.us. It is a, uh, a, a, an effort to reform the mass blanket suspicionless surveillance of American citizens that the NSA has been uh, up to for the last, uh, well, y years. Um, uh, it's something that has dovetailed very easily into the film. Aaron was concerned about that as well. We found a bunch of uh, clips of Aaron a year before Edward Snowden came forward uh, talking about uh, his worries about the NSA. And it's relatively uh, chilling, uh, actually, to, to see him sort of so, so far ahead of that curve. Um, so uh, there's stopwatching.us. There's all kinds of, uh, we've sent letters to Congress. We've, uh, we've done um, marches on Washington, D.C., things like that. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a filmmaker, and I'm marginally part of it. I've been there since the beginning. There, there's some serious activists involved. Um, there's also another, another site that's a spinoff called uh, The Day We Fight Back, and they're planning a day of action against NSA overreach on February 11th. Um, so I have occasionally done, um, done small pieces for them that have been outtakes from the film. Uh, I did a New York Times op doc about why I care about the NSA, why people should care about the about this, um, along with some other stuff for EFF that has really, it's just really kind of been born out of the film and yet it's something sort of different at the same time. And um, so, Phil. I think one thing that Brian is, is talking about and that this panel is about is that there used to be a vision of a film as an object. A film is an aesthetic object that you create, that you finish, that then has a place in the world in a specific way. And I think that what's evolved over time, mostly because of social media and technology, is that a film is an experience. And I don't mean the experience in the cinema watching it, it's the experience of it getting made, it developing an audience, people seeing it, people interacting with it, people acting socially around it. And a film is not just an object anymore. A film is a piece of a movement and a way in which people interact with the world and with each other. And I think that has happened all on its own because of social media and technology. And the more that we can accentuate that and make that possible for people, the more vibrant our films will be and the more impact they can have in the world. One, one thought on that too, I'm sure you feel this way, but it, you know, filmmaking can be brutal in the sense of what you have to cut out to make something, to really make the narrative that, that says what you want to say. A lot of times that stuff you're cutting out is valuable as it's, uh, to, to other organizations or just to another point that you want to make that may just not fit in the film but still be relevant and important. So that stuff can live online. That stuff can help your film and help your overall cause, not just, not just this kind of uh, uh, awareness of the film and ho uh, help distribute, distributing it, but, uh, but to bring awareness to the thing that made you want to make the film in the first place. Um, and so, uh, rather than leaving all that stuff on a hard drive somewhere, you know, take a few days and, and form it and, and, and share it with people. I think to, to kind of add to that, when we're working with filmmakers, it's we have two goals. One, how do we get people to see the film? And two, how do we get them to do something? But kind of a, somewhere meshed in between the two is how do we get them to engage in any way with the film, even if they don't get the chance to see the film when we want them to? Do they interact with that content? Do they interact with the campaign? Do they help amplify the message in some way? And I think both of what you guys are doing are, are worth highlighting as, as two tools. You have a, a very clear hashtag. It's very easy for people to participate in that. For, for people who are here that are filmmakers and doing social impact campaigns, I think one thing to take away from that is keep your, your message very focused and very clear if you want people to participate in it. Um, just make it very simple. And I think what you're doing with the, the Day of Action is something that I've seen a lot of films do, have great success with. You have, I, I'm not even sure, eight or ten organizations involved in this. Yeah. It's incredible. And so you're bringing together this, co this coalition of organizations with a similar goal and a similar message, and you've created this day that everyone can participate in. And while much of it's happening online, the film is a great opportunity for people to be offline, to gather offline and, and see something, ex experience something together, and then talk about it or do something afterwards. So they're both great examples. Yeah, I think, I mean, for instance, um, I mean, the Bahrain section of our film, uh, 
was filmed entirely sort of undercover by my co-producer, Roseanne, inside Bahrain. So the Bahraini government, up until we started talking about this, really has no idea this film is coming. So what we want uh, t tomorrow night after the premiere is sort of suddenly this burst of social media activity coming from Park City about Bahrain and about Free Zainab al Khawaja, which I think will be, hopefully, uh, something that will have real, real impact because her next court date is coming up in early February. So we think we can actually maybe have some real, some real impact. But it's a question of trying to find, like you say, simple messages that we can, of course, there's deeper messages to the film you want an audience to take, but in terms of what we can actually do. And I remember once I made a film about the Rwandan genocide years ago, and I showed it, and um, it was very powerful, and somebody stood up at the end of the, uh, during a Q&A and was quite angry. She said, you've, you've, you've provoked all these feelings in me, and now I don't know what to do with it. You know, what am I gonna, what, what do I do? And I, and so now I think that you always have to, as a filmmaker, think that if, you, if you're gonna bring out those kinds of emotions, you have to have, to have something that people can then, can then do right after, right after that. Channel that, that, that passion that hopefully they feel after watching your, f your film and make it into a sort of a longer lasting experience and hopefully have some kind of impact. I think, as we've done before, like it's what's that first step that people can participate in? And you're going to have people who want to do more and do more. And to, to bring up the Cove example, I think we had one girl in that campaign who did a sting operation at a, a Japanese uh, restaurant to see if she could find a way. Right down the corner from my house. So yeah. yeah. That girl, I never we, ate there. She, we talked to her a lot. She was very active, and we ran out of things for her to do, but she yeah. created something. So I've actually, if, could you talk a little bit more about this, this action or thunderclap of action you guys are doing from Park City? Like, how are you orchestrating that? Uh, well, um, I, I think, you know, the, the film is, uh, I mean, almost half of it is, is the story of uh, Miriam and her sister. So I think after the film, people just, we reveal at the end that, that sh sh Zainab's in jail. And now, and hasn't seen her, hasn't spent any meaningful time with her daughter for a year. And it's just, it's so heart-wrenching. You want to sort of do something. So we're going to, you know, we're starting quite simply. We're sort of having these Twitter... Uh, Twitter campaign, Free Zainab. We have hashtag We Are The Giant. Uh, we're launching a website today. Um, it's all quite simple, um, but if people come onto the website, we want to capture their email addresses so that um, when the film is eventually distributed, we have some kind of, sort of uh, database that we can then sort of build on. And we're also looking you know, to uh, mainstream media, hopefully some blogs, people with the, who, uh, Nick Kristoff with the New York Times has already written about Zainab, so hopefully we're sort of built on that. Other sort of prominent websites that might write about it. And just kind of create a, a sort of snowball effect that we can then sort of use to kind of just put this issue on the radar of, of policymakers. Because right now there's absolutely no pressure on anybody in the U.S. government. And I know people who feel like, uh, who know that our policy towards Bahrain is shameful. Um, and yet, there's really no sort of leverage to kind of provoke any kind of change. The film's not just about Bahrain, by the way. I mean, the other thing we want to do is to tell the story of some of these extraordinary nonviolent activists inside Syria who began the uprising uh, against Bashar Assad um, using social media, but literally just going door to door and getting friends to come out on the streets. We have footage in the film of the very first protest, 50 people. And, uh, and then it's sort of snowballed and snowballed and soon they had 40,000 people, but then they were faced with this, this horrible choice of what to do when the government cracks down. And, um, and then, then we saw sort of the, the birth of the, fr the Free Syrian Army and eventually the, they, they sort of lost control of, of the revolution they began. And they are still out there, still on Facebook, still on Twitter, sort of telling their story. And, and we're really trying to try to shine a light on that because it's just not true when you hear people say, well, you know, it's always been violent in Syria. It wasn't. It began as a nonviolent, very carefully sort of thought out, nonviolent um, movement against, against a dictator. And that, that then turned into something else, large in, it, for lots of reasons, but often also because of our indifference. And, uh, and we did nothing for a year uh, while, the, while the, it sort of s cancer spread. So part of what we want to do is just to kind of raise awareness and change the narrative a bit. Um, and ultimately, you know, with regard to Bahrain in particular, try to affect some policy, because it's possible to do. Thank you all. So I want to open it up to the audience for questions. Um, well, I can start. I was, I was um, 
the story of how my film started is I was on a uh, um, I was on a panel talking about hackers and hacktivists, which I, I was doing a lot of after We Are Legion. Uh, and I was on a panel with a bunch of people that knew Aaron uh, about a week after he died. And uh, it was very somber, it was obviously very, very emotional, and I started filming right, right then. And I wasn't, I wasn't sure if this was gonna be a film or not uh, at the time. And uh, I had a conversation with his father at one point down the road after I'd been filming a little bit. And I just found it to be very, very moving. Uh, he had just lost a son. I had become a father for the first time myself. I had just lost a, uh, a friend myself to suicide about four months previous. And so um, being the hero of your own story, it, it, the, it, there, was, there was a moment and a kind of growing realization that, um, that I had been spent years in this world of hacktivism and uh, understanding these stories and understanding this technology and um, that I was the person to tell the story. Uh, well, I just, um, you know, I've, I've always asked myself what I, um, as a storyteller, I'm always intrigued by people who are confronted with moments of crises, because I think crises kind of define an individual. And um, when the revolution started in the Middle East, I saw what, what people were, were doing and, and putting themselves on the line for an ideal and risking their lives and sometimes losing their lives. And, and I would ask myself what I would have done, you know? What would I have done if I was, you know, around in the 60s or the 50s during the Civil Rights Movement? Would I have joined the marches? Would I have taken those risks? Would I have taken up arms in the American Revolution? Would I have gone to fight, you know, for freedom in Spain and the, you know, the f Spanish Civil War? Who knows? You know, I think most of us, when confronted with these moments, often, you know, don't live up to our highest ideals. And so I saw people who were doing that. And I just felt like, if I can find a way of telling a, a, a making a film that took us inside the experience of being a revolutionary, it's not about the Arab Spring per se, it's just that revolutions happen in waves across history. And the current wave is, is, in, the, is in the Middle East. The last one was in 89 in Eastern Europe. I think we were low, that was so relatively uh, bloodless because the Soviet Union decided not to, not to crush them. Um, but they had crushed, crushed uprisings previously in Eastern Europe. But, um, but generally revolutions are, are long, bloody, painful, and not always, they don't always have the outcome that, uh, that the people who began them might have in mind. But what they do seem to do is they, def they, 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 they present moral choices to the people who are involved with them. Who are you really? What do you really stand for? And what's just been so humbling for me is to watch characters like, well, people like um, Miriam, her family, our characters from Syria. We have another extraordinary story from Libya about people who made these, faced these tough decisions and made these choices. So why me? I don't know. I just felt like it was a story I wanted to tell, you know. Um, and it just, I had some experience in the region, but I don't feel like this is my story. I feel like this is their story. And, uh, and all I can do is help bring it to a screen and bring it to an audience. You know, I think as a filmmaker, I, I look, look for stories that, that, that bring me into interesting, bigger picture kinds of topics and things that I care about. And as you're telling those kind of stories, in the case of Aaron, it's a, it's a, it's a it's both a kind of poignant chronology of internet history and it's this kind of tragic um, personal story that you hear uh, of, his, of his life and, and the sort of certainly the last couple of years. Um, and that story takes us into these interesting other areas and it lets you raise questions and, and lets you kind of explore, uh, your, lets your curiosity get into all this other stuff. Um, but you often don't have the time to really flesh that out because you're really sort of telling a story of a person. And so um, what I think is great is that, you know, uh, take, taking offline, I mean, the internet is the best forum for this, you know? Uh, there's all kinds of ways to kind of organize this on, on your own website, um, on the film's website, uh, to teaming up with other, uh, s s you know, sort of action groups of action that, that are sympathetic to that, to those causes. Um, use, let, letting them use some of that. It's a way of broadening this story and, and getting deeper into these smaller issues in, in, in kind of quick ways that people can kind of digest and understand where you're coming from and, and yet maintain this kind of personal story that, that brought you there in the first place. I think there's um, three different examples I could think of where we've used this extra content. One is 
clips that um, clips from the film or I mean just for your PR and marketing you want to get it out there give it to bloggers give it to press give it to organizations with large distribution lists um, so that's, that's one way to help raise awareness for the film the second way is there's an organization we worked with re or a film we worked with recently um, and an organization that they interviewed and spent a lot of time with didn't make the cut but so instead they're making them their own kind of short documentary under three minutes and then the, the, that organization is then going to put it in um, schools across the country which is a great uh, for both the organization and the film. And then a third way, um, where I think really did this well, was God Loves Uganda, where they were lucky that they had a filmmaker with them, and that filmmaker was able to, to get footage of the campaign. So the, once the film was done, the story kept going. The film went to Africa, the film played here at Sundance a year ago, and the, fil um, the filmmaker that was with them was able to capture audience reactions and show uh, the continuation of the story. I think one answer to that question is that uh, you can use a film, an organization can use a film to generate support and action within its own supporters. So for example, there's a film E-Team that's here at Sundance this year about uh, folks who work at Human Rights Watch who do the research on the ground on human rights abuses and report it, and the film is a, is a verite portrait of exactly what they do on the ground. That's a film that can be used by a variety of different human rights organizations to bring people together, to motivate them to act in a particular moment, because the screening of the film or the presentation of a film can be a way of organizing people. And so you can use films for all kinds of things, and what you need is just a relationship with the filmmakers or with folks like Christy who are using the film precisely to do that, to create change on the ground. So just to, I think you'd mentioned film festivals and Sundance. Um, I keep giving examples, sorry, they're easy. Two examples and another one, God Loves Uganda, not just because you guys are sitting here. Um, last year at Sundance, uh, they premiered and they had a big, they launched their trailer and they had a great uh, press opportunity to get the trailer out there. At the same time, we worked with an organization called All Out, which had a few million members on their list, and they launched a page on their website that featured the trailer, but also a strong call to action um, related to the, the bill making a hom uh, homosexuality illegal in Uganda. So it was a great opportunity to use the press coming out of Sundance and coming out around the trailer along with this action um, with All Out. Uh, or the other example was uh, Rich Hill, which is playing here this weekend. Uh, we've invited or, um, members from the Boys and Girls Club and Big Brothers Big Sisters to come see the film. They're, they're local chapter heads uh, to come see this film and have a conversation afterwards. Could I just add something real quick? Um, I think what is really an obstacle usually is how to keep it going. Because it's easy to get that first reaction of people wanting to do something about it. It's very difficult to keep the momentum up. And what we've seen happen in Bahrain is that a lot of these governments have now learned that if they can take the first couple of slaps in the face that come and, you know, hold out during that, then it eventually dies down and they can keep the person in prison for as long as they want if they can go through that first period of bad PR and bad reactions. And we've seen this happening over and over again. For example, with my sister's case specifically, the first couple of times she was arrested, there was a massive response on Twitter because she was very well known on Twitter and not just in Bahrain, but across the region. And within hours, she would be released. And so what the Bahraini government did, which was actually very smart, is they kept arresting her and releasing her within a couple of hours. And so she was arrested up to 10 times like that. And so after five, six times of arrest, people were like, well, she's going to get out in a couple of hours, so we don't really need to do that response thing anymore. And so that's when we saw her getting sentences like six months or one year in prison because there was no longer that instant response of people getting angry that she's being arrested. So there's also always the problem of how do you keep up the mo momentum, even if you have the movie, how do you keep up the momentum of people actually putting pressure on the government? You know, that, that sort of takes us back to where we were at the beginning of this kind of constantly bringing something new, right? This, this, uh, this sense that something can be really effective uh, in two or three examples, and then, you know, there's a reaction to it. There's a learning of how to, how to deal with it, including the, the sort of PR nightmare that comes. Uh, and so uh, people on the front lines, like, I mean, it's, it's almost like, bring something new every single time. It's this, it's this idea that now there are new tools. You can't use them in the same way every single time. They can't, you, re recreating something like SOPA is very difficult, right? But there are new things, right? So uh, things that peop people haven't seen before. So um, it's that continual innovation, I guess, in, in getting out the word. When we look at films, we really have three lenses through which we choose to work on films. One is it has to be a great film. As a piece of cinema, it has to work. 
uh, it's not interesting to work on things that aren't good um, and they don't reach people. Um, uh, another point is that it has to deal with a compelling social issue. And the final point is that however much money the filmmakers are looking for, we have to feel like we can get that back. You know, our, our goal as an organization is not to make money off documentary film. I think that would be foolhardy for anyone who wanted to try. But the goal is instead to be able to cycle money so that you put money into one film, you get it back, and it can then cycle into the other one. And if you do that, which we've been doing, you end up having more money than if you were just giving it away. My take on that is the bigger the discussion, the better. The more, the more you're engaged in that discussion, the better it is. Obviously, you don't want to give away your whole film, but um, like, I, like I was saying earlier, it feels like there's lots of little things that might not even make it into the film that could have great interest and could actually whet people's appetite for, for more. So um, as a filmmaker, I think you're naturally uh, thinking about that stuff anyway. If you, you don't want to say too much, and you want to... You know, you tease a little bit with trailers and with footage that you release um, but you know I, I think certain films lend themselves it depends on the topic for sure um, certain films don't lend themselves to this but but I think some films are meant to be big discussions and, and I think you can have that discussion pretty early on and I think that um, I wasn't sure the distinction you were making with Kickstarter but I do think that um, that actual um, issue-driven uh, documentary films can be, uh, we raised on Kickstarter, um, I think it's a really powerful uh, tool for that. So I think uh, Kickstarter seems to be a range of things from the fun to the serious. Um, thank you so much to all of our panelists for taking the time to be here. Thank you all for coming.